Hello friends, you're watching 3ABN Sabbath School panel. My name is Ryan Day and as always it's a blessing to have our family studying with us each and every week. We hope that you're excited about this study. We're studying life everlasting. Mm. Can't wait for it, right? Because in this life all we know is death and despair and sorrow mm. and pain and all of those horrible things that come along with it. But Jesus is going to come one day and he's going to make all things new. And I can't wait as we're studying with this. I'm learning more and more and I'm excited about the panel we have with us today. My my friends and family in Christ. To my direct left is Pastor John Dinsey. How are you, brother? By God's grace, I'm doing well. And I have Monday deceived by the serpent. Mm. All right. Praise the Lord. Of course, to your left is Miss Jill Morconi. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. Excited to be here. I have You Will Not Die. Mm. Amen. All right. And to your left is Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Ryan. And I have Wednesday's lesson, which is Consequences of Sin. All mm. right. And way down at the end of the table, <laughs> last but not least, Ms. Shelley Quinn. I'm excited about my lesson. And it is the first gospel promise. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to pray in just a moment. But before we do, I always like to just remind us we're studying lesson number two, which is entitled Death in a Sinful World. And our memory text comes from Romans chapter 5, verse 12, which says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. And so, on that note, Ms. Jill Morconi, would you like to pray for us? Sure. Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, grateful for the plan of salvation set in motion from the beginning of time. Thank you, God, for the opportunity we have to study your word and to learn more about you. We ask for the infilling of the Holy Spirit just now, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As I was studying this lesson, uh, Sabbath afternoon really set the, 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 uh, just the foundation for everything we're going to be studying this week. And it pulled some quotes from one of my favorite books, The Story of Redemption. And I just want to read some of this because this is powerful. So it goes on to say here, this is Sabbath afternoon's lesson. It says, Christ was the divine agent through whom God bought the universe, and, or excuse me, brought the universe and the world into existence. But when God the Father conferred special honor on Christ and announced that they together would create this world, Lucifer was envious and jealous of Jesus Christ. Of course, that quote is found in Story of Redemption, page 14. And it goes on to say, and of course, plotted against him. Mm -hmm. It goes on to say, having been cast out of heaven, Satan decided to destroy the happiness of Adam and Eve and on earth and thereby cause grief in heaven. He imagined that if he could in any way beguile them, mm. of course, Adam and Eve, it says to disobedience, God would make some provision whereby they might be pardoned. And then himself and all the fallen angels would be in, fair, in a fair way to share with them of God's mercy. Of course, this is from Story of Redemption, page 27. Mm. But it goes on to say, fully aware of Satan's strategy, God warned Adam and Eve not to expose themselves to the temptation. We find that in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, which we're going to read in just a few moments. And then it says here on the final line, this means that even when the world was still perfect and blameless, there were already clear restrictions for human beings to obey, which sets us up for Sunday's lesson entitled Statements in Tension. And uh, we're going to be going to Genesis chapter 2. So if you want to go with me to Genesis chapter 2, we're going to read those verses, verses 16 and 17. And let's just kind of, you know, set the, the context here because this is Adam and Eve before sin. So this is a perfect world. This is that beautiful, perfect, uninterrupted communion between God and man. And as we just saw, God has been working with them. He's been informing them. He's been teaching them and guiding them. Uh, but yet here comes Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, where God now adds the condition. And it says here, verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And I like the way the lesson brings this out. How does this bring about or how does this communicate free will in any of its aspects? Because some, some people would read this and think, well, God really didn't give them a choice. You know, they, they didn't really have a choice. He's telling them what they have to do. But I think that this very statement, it screams the fact that God is giving them a free will and free choice. Even though he's commanding them and saying, you shall not eat of the tree uh, in the midst of the garden or you will die. Mm -hmm. They still had that freedom of will, that freedom of choice to either choose to obey or to not obey. And that's, I think that's a, 
uh, provided there in the context very clearly. And Pastor James, you brought this out last week, which was powerful. And I just want to reiterate it, that the Bible makes it clear that God is love. Mm -hmm. And if we studied the scripture from that very perspective, the fact that God is love, that's why I love the great conflict of the ages series written by Mrs. White, because again, patriarchs and prophets begins with those three words, God is love. And then the great controversy, very last words, God is love, because those are the two great bookends that, that everything that's happening in the Amen. scripture mm -hmm. is fulfilling the fact that God is not just mere loving, you know, he's not just capable of, of loving characteristics like you and I, you know, we can love each other and express kindness and, you know, all of the good things that come along with that. But the Bible says God is love. And you brought out last week, which I thought was really nice. And that's the fact that true godly love, mm -hmm. the fact that of his very essence, his very nature, that he is love. True love requires freedom, yeah. which means freedom with that freedom mm -hmm. involves risk. Mm -hmm. And of course, risk entails responsibility mm -hmm. and responsibility enables growth. And so it's powerful to think that when God created Adam and Eve, he invested in him and everything that he had, he invested in them the free will and the free choice to ultimately reject him. You just wrap your mind around that. It's a mystery. The fact that, that God in all of his grandeur and all of his majesty and all of his greatness, that he, he created Adam and Eve, he's the created, mm -hmm. and he invested in them the ability and the free will and free choice to reject the creator. Mm -hmm. And it's powerful to think that, of course, God is a God of freedom. He's, he's not creating a bunch of little robots down here, right? We're all, we're, we all have the free will and the free choice to serve him as we should. And that is exactly what God is instilling within them in this choice. If you want to live and you want to pass the ultimate test, just don't eat of that tree. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's, they'll say there may be, a, I don't know, there might have been a thousand other trees in the garden. There's 999. Yes, you can eat from that one. Yes, you can eat from that one. Yep, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Just not that one over there. But yet, what does the devil do? Mm -hmm. He comes along and he twists it and he makes God out to be someone that he's not exactly what he did in heaven with the fallen yes. angels. Now he brings that as we learned last week. Now this, this spirit of unbelief now transfers itself down here on earth as the enemy now has access only from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. He has access to Adam and Eve and Eve, we know, got a little bit too close to that tree one day. Mm -hmm. So let's go over to Genesis chapter three. But before we get there, before we read that in Genesis three, I want to read this because that, that spirit of Satan, that spirit of unbelief, uh, this comes from page Patriarchs and Prophets, page 35, powerful quote, and it's not too long of a quote. It says, so long as all created beings acknowledged the allegiance of love, there was perfect harmony throughout the universe of God. It was the joy of the heavenly host to fulfill the purpose of their creator. They delighted in reflecting his glory and showing forth his praise. Isn't that awesome? And he goes on to say, and while the love, notice, while love to God was supreme, love for one another was confiding and unselfish. Mm. There was no note of discord to mar the celestial harmonies. But here's the, here's the line I want you to read here. But a change came over this happy state. There was one who, and notice these words, perverted the freedom. Mm. There was one who perverted the freedom that God had granted to his creatures. Mm. Satan Lucifer perverted the freedom in heaven. Now he's going to bring this down on earth and he's going to cause again Adam and Eve to pervert this freedom as well. And so sometime after this warning, of course, uh, from God, Satan assumed the form of a serpent, we know, and also entered, uh, entered uh, Eden. Uh, Eve beheld the serpents uh, joyfully eaten and forbidden, the, you know, eating the forbidden fruit without dying, right? Could you imagine seeing this creature eating this fruit and he's up there just eating it up and he's not dying and how he's challenging them. So we see this right off the cuff in Genesis chapter three, beginning in verse one. Now there's some verses here I'm going to go through that's going to be unpacked in a greater degree in the, in the next lessons to come. But I just want to do a quick overview of this. Genesis chapter three, beginning with verse one. It says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. Mm -hmm. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So right off the cuff, we see that there is an implied accusation mm -hmm. against the character of God. He's doing the same thing to Eve that he did to the angels in heaven. He mm -hmm. wants to cause Eve to see God in a different way, mm -hmm. to picture him and, and see him in such a way that he's really not. In other words, he's trying to pervert the character of God. And I, I heard a minister say this one time, and it's, I've, I've always, it's always stuck with me, that sin is ultimately the results of the misrepresentation of the character of God. Yes. And that's ultimately what we see happening here in the Garden of Eden. So what, what, is, what, what is the accusation against the character of God here when he's 
says, did God really say to you, mm -hmm. Eve, that you can't eat of every tree in the garden? Is, is that the kind of God you want to serve? Mm -hmm. Well, he's implying the fact that, you know, God's unclear. He's unreasonable. He's restricted. He's a restrictive God. You should have right to eat from any of these trees that you want. And that's exactly, you know, that feeds into our human nature mm -hmm. because we, we, don't, we naturally don't like people to tell us what to do. <laughs> we like to do what we want to do. And when someone comes along and says, uh, don't eat that, uh, don't wear that, don't watch that, don't listen to that, don't write in that, don't go do that. Uh, naturally, we want to do the opposite because it's just like, hmm, you know what? I can do what I want to do. I'm an adult. Uh, but th that's essentially what the spirit of the enemy is trying to impose upon yeah, Eve here. And so it goes on to say in verse two, it says, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Mm. And then of course, here it comes. Then the serpent said to the woman, you're not, you will not surely die. In other words, he's got that fruit and he's, look at here, I'm not dying. Mm. Surely, and here's the implied accusation against God's character. God's a liar. He's lying to you. Mm. You're not really going to die. Look, I'm eating of it. And therefore, the fact that you're observing me eat of this fruit and I'm not dead, which means God is untrustworthy. He's dishonest. You cannot trust him. Mm. And then, of course, comes the big blow. Verse 5. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Mm. And so, again, this one is he's finally saying God is selfish. God is only looking out for himself. He wants all the goodies for himself. Mm -hmm. And so you'll be basically, Eve, you're better off without God. And so right here, what we see in the Garden of, of Eden is Satan is is step by step breaking Eve down to question God. And I love what the I love what the lesson brings out here. It says, unfortunately, in deciding between the two conflicting statements, Eve ignored three basic principles. And this is powerful. And we can learn something from this. The first one, human reason is not always the safest way to evaluate spiritual matters. In fact, I want to add there, I know what the author meant by this, but I want to add there that it's never, mm -hmm. it's never a safe way. It's never a safe way to evaluate spiritual matters. What are we supposed to do according to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6? Mm -hmm. Trust, in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Mm -hmm. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your path. Mm -hmm. We should never trust ourselves. In this case, Eve did. She trusted her own, uh, her, her, she, she trusted her own basic uh, nature in, in deciding this. And of course, uh, she evaluated according to her own discernment. Of course, that didn't work out for her. The second one, it says, the Word of God can appear to be illogical mm -hmm. and senseless to us, but, is, but it is always right and trustworthy. Is there times that sometimes you read something and it's like, mm, I don't know if that makes sense. Lord, why did you put that in there? Lord, why did you say this? But ultimately, can we still trust in the word of the Lord even when it doesn't make sense to us in the moment? Amen. And then lastly, number three, it says, there are things that are not evil or wrong in themselves, mm. but God has chosen them as tests of obedience. Mm. And so my friends, on that point, let us surrender to the Lord and let us not fall into the deceptions of the enemy. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. Now, there's a little bit of overlap, and we, I also have Genesis 3, 1 through 7, and the title is Deceived by the Serpent. Mm. Deceived by the Serpent. And for the sake of those that may be a little fuzzy on what the word deceive means, it means to cause to accept as true or valid what is false or invalid. Mm. So I first like to take you to Genesis chapter 1, verse 31 to establish the fact that Adam and Eve were created perfect. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, the Bible says, Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Mm -hmm. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Adam and Eve were created perfect. Mm -hmm. And everything in uh, God's creation was perfect. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it was not a bad tree. It wasn't poisonous. It was a good tree, but God put just one test, one, I'm, I was gonna say little, one little test, <laughs> don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I like to bring out the fact that in Matthew, Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 39, uh, it says, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Mm. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Now, why did I read this? It's because Adam and Eve loved God with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their mind. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Had he not created such a beautiful place for them to live in? Had he not created so many trees from them to eat from, so many beautiful animals that could be their companions? Mm -hmm. And they lived in the days when you could walk down the street <laughs> with no fear that you're going to get eaten by a lion mm. <laughs> or swallowed by some other animal. They were happy. And this was paradise for mm -hmm. them. And had not they sinned, we would be living in this beautiful paradise of earth that God created, which was very good. Now, the first, that's the first and great commandment. The second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. These are the principles by which God's government is run all over the universe. Mm -hmm. So when we go into Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, we need to keep in mind that Eve loved God. It was not her intention to disobey God. But you see, there is the deceiver mm -hmm. and Satan used the serpent to deceive. Now it says here in verse one, as we already read, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Again, we see here that God is limiting your freedom. God is not allowing you to eat from all the trees. He is not giving you everything that you deserve. Mm. You deserve more than this. But you see, what did Eve uh, love God? Notice how Eve then uh, responds. And let's go to Genesis uh, chapter 2, uh, chapter 3, verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees, plural, of the garden. She comes to God's defense. She loves the Lord. She's defending the Lord mm. because she loves him. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, mm. lest you die. Mm. Now, we don't have record that God said, lest you touch it. This is, uh, I'm going to say perhaps in her mind, God said, don't eat of it. I'm not even going to bother to touch it. Mm -hmm. Perhaps this is her, her decision. I'm not going to bother to even touch it. Because if I can't eat it, why touch it? <laughs> so uh, this is her, 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 her words to the, the serpent. And I, I remind you that the serpent was used by the devil. And if you go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, we are reminded, it says, So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. She is dealing mm. with the devil. Mm. And now... Here is what we have in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, mm -hmm. you will not surely die. What do we have here? We have a direct contradiction to what Eve said that God mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now Eve hears for the first time a lie. Mm -hmm. And so she has to evaluate. Everything she has heard has been true, 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 true. But now she hears a lie. Her first inclination is to evaluate, evaluate it as truth. But wait a minute, it conflicts with what God has said. She is now in conflict. She has to make a decision. But you see, the devil has to paint the picture in such a, such a uh, attracting manner that he has to let her know, by eating of this tree, you are going to benefit. Mm. You are going to rise higher. You are now going to be liberated. And so let's look at the words that we uh, find in Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 5. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Mm. Painted the idea of knowing evil as something good, something attractive, <laughs> something you should desire sure. to have. So Eve is evaluating this to the degree that she began to doubt God. Because now she looks at the tree. Look, at, look what it says in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, mm -hmm. that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit mm -hmm. and ate. And so we, we're going to stop here in reading this verse to evaluate what she said. The woman saw that the tree was good. She evaluated. She was an intelligent woman. Mm -hmm. She was created perfect. Perfect understanding. And so now she is looking at it. Hey, this is good. Again, she had the choice of at least a thousand trees, let's say. <laughs> and, I, you know, one of the things I love is fruits. I, last uh, month, I discovered there are at least six more fruits that I have never tasted. <laughs> and I have tasted some really good fruits. Mm. 
And so imagine the discoveries they had. And I'm, I'm going to venture out to say they had not even tasted all of the trees yet. Mm. Mm. But now they are being enticed, deceived into believing, hey, this is something great. This is something wonderful. You are going to rise. Be like God. Well, she admired God. God was wonderful. Mm -hmm. God was great. But the devil is trying to tell her, you're going to be like God. You're going to rise to where he is. Yeah. Knowing good and evil. As if knowing evil was something wonderful. The woman saw that the tree was good for food. You see, there seems to be a hint that she had never even looked at the fruit when she says she saw that it was good for food. Mm. She wasn't hungry, <laughs> but she's looking at it as something to be desired. What, is, what does it say? Desired to make one what? Wise. 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 So she mm. took of its fruit and ate. She also gave her husband with her and ate. And he ate. So she saw this as something that has properties to make me wise. Mm. Wisdom in knowing good and knowledge and wisdom in knowing evil. Mm. I am going to rise. Mm. And again, the word deceive means you believe a lie. She, be she really did believe that this was going to happen to her. And hey, here's the serpent eating this fruit. Mm -hmm. And hey, you're going to be great. And so now she ate of the fruit and then she becomes an accomplice for the devil because mm -hmm. it says she also gave to her husband mm -hmm. with her and he ate. Now I'd like to point something out here because uh, somebody gave me a book once. Hey, take a look at this book. And this author was saying that Adam was there with Eve, kind of just listening. Uh, and I, I really cannot accept that. That Adam was just quiet there, just <laughs> waiting for this conversation to end, waiting for Eve to take up the fruit. Didn't say anything. Eve, don't take, don't take. No. Uh, Adam was not with her. Mm -hmm. She took of the fruit and went to find Adam. Mm -hmm. And he, she gave to him and he evaluated the situation himself because he chose to eat. They had something wonderful that mm -hmm. God gives to each and every one of us, freedom of choice. God did not, does not mm -hmm. make robots. So Adam and Eve had the choice not to eat of the forbidden fruit. So here we see that uh, we go now to verse seven. Adam ate different from Eve, not really um, as Eve desiring to make one, he didn't evaluate all that. Oh, this is going to make me wise. This is going to make me ask God, knowing good and evil. He didn't look at that. He saw his wife. Mm. She ate of it. And he ventured. You know, it's interesting that in the book, Patriots and Prophets, he imagined himself without her, loved oh. her, imagined himself without her. How am I going to go on mm. without her? Right, right. And God, remember, God made Eve from a rib. He was bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh mm -hmm. and he loved Eve and so he ventured to take of the fruit whatever the cost may be. Mm -hmm. They both disobeyed mm -hmm. and it says there in Genesis 3, 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Mm -hmm. Already you see there their effort to cover the mistakes and yeah. to, to take place of something God had given them, mm -hmm. garments of light, which we don't have time to talk about right now. <laughs> All right. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Denzi, for that. Mm -hmm. well, we're going to take a short break, my friends, and we'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to pass it on to Ms. Jill Morricone for Tuesday's lesson. Thank you so much, Pastor Ryan and Pastor Johnny. What an amazing study and kind of a sad study, too, as you think about it. The entrance of sin, Adam and Eve choosing to step into sin, Eve being deceived, Adam openly with his eyes wide open stepping into that. Mm -hmm. On Tuesday's lesson, we look at you will not die. And that we just take from one verse in Genesis chapter three, verse four. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. This is the first lie as Pastor Johnny brought out and Pastor Ryan, the first lie that was told. 
to Adam and Eve. This is, of course, by Satan himself, the serpent. But this lie originating in the Garden of Eden, this lie of the immortality of the soul, that the soul will not die, has continued from that day all the way down to this. So we're going to take a look at that. What is the immortality of the soul? And then we're going to look at the doctrine, what the Word of God teaches, that when we die, we are unconscious, that we die and we rest in the grave until Jesus comes. So we're going to look at that. Some people call that soul sleep, but it literally just means metaphorically that we are resting. We have no emotions, no thoughts, and we're resting in the grave. So we're going to look at that. Let's start with the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. For that, it asserts that the human person is the unity of the spiritual soul and the physical body. In other words, we're comprised of this physical shell that we have that this is this body. And when we die, the body dies, but the soul doesn't die. And the soul lives on. Of course, we know that that's the lie that the serpent told Eve in the Garden of Eden. And we see this throughout history. You can study it, the ancient religions and philosophies. You can see it in ancient Egypt. They did the mummification process and the pyramids. And that was all built on an understanding that there was an afterlife, or even though the physical body had died, that the soul was somehow continuing on, whether it's in purgatory or in heaven or in hell. We also see this continued in the Greek Western thought and philosophy. Socrates taught it and he's credited um, as teaching that the immortal soul survives beyond the death of the body. Mm. Now Socrates' pupil, his name was Plato, and he was the founder of the Academy in Athens. And his doctrine of the immortality of the soul is one of his most influential ideas. It was adopted, developed, and criticized by philosophers and theologians from late antiquity all the way to the modern period. And in fact, they say that the Christian church and how the Christian church adopted this doctrine of immortality of the soul, that came in a large degree to the teaching that Plato had on his followers. We see this doctrine of the immortality of the soul or the soul continuing on after death. We see that in the Catholic church. We see it in most many Protestant churches today. We also see it in secular culture, whether it's a movie or a TV program or a book or a news article. Oftentimes they talk about what happens after death mm -hmm. or how people continue on in life. And we know it's going to be part of the end time deception. That is spiritualism will be combined with this belief of immortality of the soul. But let's look at what the Word of God teaches. And as we look at this doctrine of Christian mortalism, we see the earliest Christian instance that they see in writings. It is in Tatian's address to the Greeks. This is second century AD. And he just writes this, the soul is not in itself immortal. We also see strong proponents of this belief in the reformers. It was kind of hidden for a while during the years of the Dark Ages when the Roman Catholic Church reigned supreme. And then the reformers brought this belief, this doctrine back to the forefront. Martin Luther believed the state of the dead was a deep dreamless sleep, removed from time and space, without consciousness and without feeling. William Tyndale said by putting them, this is the departed souls, in heaven, hell, or purgatory, Purgatory. It destroys the arguments that Christ and Paul gave to prove the resurrection. And again, he said, if the souls are in heaven, tell me what causes there of the resurrection. Mm. Then John Wycliffe taught that the doctrine of soul sleep was the answer to the Catholic teaching of purgatory and masses for the dead. We know that the Anabaptists taught and believed it as well. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church today, we believe what the Word of God teaches about the state of the dead. So let's look at that. We believe that, number one, soul is the union of the physical body, the dirt, let's look at Genesis 2 verse 7, with the breath of life. Genesis 2 verse 7, it said, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. This is the physical component of the body. 
and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being or a living soul. That word nefesh means a soul or a living creature, and it's mm -hmm. used 754 times. So in other words, the soul is not somehow separate from the body. People do not have souls, they are mm -hmm. souls. That's right. So when we stop breathing, we cease existence. Mm -hmm. When we stop breathing, the Spirit says, in fact, death is simply the cessation of life. And so let's look at that. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Death is not the separation of the soul and body. Death is not the physical body somehow dying mm -hmm. and the soul going up into heaven or going somewhere else and continuing on. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Dust will return to the earth as it was and the Spirit will return to the God who gave it. Now, sometimes people read that and say, oh, that proves immortality of the soul, right? Because the person, the, the physical body dies, and then the spirit, or they think soul, returns to the God who gave it. But that's not what it's saying right. at all. That simply means that when God breathed into man, he became a living soul. The breath plus the body Amen. equals a living soul. Amen. So when we die, our breath ceases. There's no longer any breath in our body. We cease to exist. Death is simply an unconscious sleep. Now by that, we don't mean that it's simply asleep. It is a metaphor, Shelley would say, or a illustration, meaning that when we are dead, we are unconscious in the sense that we don't have any feelings, we don't have any emotions. We don't have any thoughts. In fact, Ecclesiastes 9 verses 5 and 6 tells us that very thing. The living know that they're going to die. But the dead, they know nothing. They have no more reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. So no memory. No emotions, no living immortal soul with emotions and personality and being floating around in heaven somehow. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that death is asleep, but it means it's like a sleep in the sense yes. that there is no, no emotions, no thoughts, no feelings. It's that state of unconsciousness until the Lord Jesus comes and resurrects us. We see everlasting life begins with the resurrection. Daniel 12, verse 2 says, mm -hmm. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, there's two resurrections talked about there, the resurrection of the just or the righteous, the resurrection of the unrighteous. We won't get into that now because a future lesson, we're going to cover that. But the point right now is that everlasting life does not begin at death as those who believe in the immortality of the soul believe. When I die, now my soul is going to live on forever. No. When I die, I am in that unconscious state until Jesus comes. That's right. And then I am resurrected. And that is the point where that everlasting life begins or that eternal life. John 5, 28 and 29 says the same thing. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. And come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. There again, there's two resurrections talked about. But the point is that 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 everlasting life, that eternal life begins at the resurrection. Now it also begins for those when Jesus comes again, who are alive, who are not in the grave, waiting for Jesus to come, those who are alive, it begins at that moment when Jesus comes again. We see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. This is talking about the second coming of Jesus. The trumpet shall sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So that's what happens for those who are in the grave waiting for Jesus to come. When they're resurrected at that moment, they are given that gift gift of immortality. And for you and I, if we are alive, when Jesus comes again, we have that tremendous privilege of being changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So I think it gives great comfort and peace to know that when we are dead, we are simply waiting 
for the resurrection of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I love the fact that a lot of the reformers uh, yes. taught that, Jill. That was quite an insight there. My name is James Rafferty and I have Wednesday's lesson, which is consequences of sin. And we're going to be moving out of Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And we're going to be moving into Genesis chapter 3, verses 7 through 19. The consequences of sin. So the lesson uh, begins here in Genesis chapter 3, 7 through 19. It also talks a little bit about Romans chapter 5, verse 12. And basically the lesson starts out by basically saying that the woman was captivated by the persuasive speech of the serpent. Uh, Eve did not anticipate the far-reaching consequences of the road that she was following. And in itself, the act of eating from a forbidden tree was not as significant as what it actually represented. It's just like, just eat this fruit. It's not a big deal. Look at me. I'm talking. The fruit gave me the ability to talk. It's, you know. And so by such an act of disobedience, Eve, though, broke her loyalty to God and she assumed a whole new allegiance to Satan. And of course, Adam followed suit. So Genesis 3 describes the fall of Adam and Eve. Uh, as some of the most, as, as, excuse me, Genesis 3 describes the fall of Adam and Eve and some of its most tragic consequences. And we're going to look at those consequences now. Number one, from a theological perspective, both were overtaken by what we could call theophobia. Phobia, fear, theo, God, a fear of God. So they hid themselves from him, it says in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. Every day God would come to the Garden of Eden and he would call out to Adam and Eve in the cool of the day and they would connect mm -hmm. together. And, you know, just like when you connect with your kids or, you know, people that are, are, are new to things and they would say, look, look what we, we discovered today. Look at this. We, we saw this today. And God would say, oh, yes, isn't that amazing? <laughs> and they would just talk about it. And, and so one day God comes to the garden and guess what? There's no Adam and Eve. He's thinking, oh, you know, they, well, he knows where they are. He knows what's going on. But in a sense, he acts as though he doesn't. He calls out to them. He's, he's wanting them to become aware of mm -hmm. what sin has done, what disobedience has done right. to their natures. And the first thing it's done to them is it's caused this theophobia, this fear of God. In fact, Adam even says that, you know, we heard your voice in the garden and we were afraid and we hid ourselves. Number two. From a psychosocial assessment, they were ashamed of themselves mm -hmm. and they began to accuse one another. Now we see this in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. Let's just take a look at the verse there. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. It says, And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Mm -hmm. So right away here we see them um, being ashamed of nakedness. Yeah. And then it goes on in verses 9 through 13 as the Lord comes uh, to speak to them, to connect with them. It goes on to say this. It says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So there's the uh, theophobia. And he said, verse 11, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldn't eat? Now, what's the direct, simple response to that question? Adam, have you eaten from the tree that I told you not to eat of? And what would you say? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Adam didn't say that. <laughs> the man said, the woman. The first thing he said, the woman. No, I asked you about the tree. I didn't talk about a woman. Okay, I didn't mention a woman. All right, I just mentioned the tree. I want to know if you ate of the tree. The woman that you gave me. So right away, we have in our fallen nature, we have this natural tendency to point the finger at a mm -hmm. circumstance, a situation, another person, at someone right. else, right? Right. Man, it's hard to shake that tendency. Yeah. Have you noticed how hard it is to t shake that tendency? We naturally tend to want to blame something else for our free decisions that we should be responsible for. Right. You know, the, re the recovery to the image of God is this idea of taking responsibility, taking ownership, you know, just basically saying the buck stops here. And that is the process through which God is restoring us to his image. And what's really amazing about the plan of salvation is Jesus came to this earth and he wasn't really responsible. Like he right. didn't really disobey God, but he mm -hmm. took the responsibility. Yeah. He said, you know what? The buck stops here. Right. I'm going to take responsibility for this whole mess. Mm. And that's why the Bible says that we as men are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. We're to take right. responsibility. Full stop, that's period. Right. Yeah. So in the context then of this expression, this, this interaction, they had this psychosocial assessment. They were ashamed of themselves and they began to curse, uh, to accuse one another. The third consequence of the fall 
uh, the quarterly goes on to say, was a physical, from a physical standpoint. They would start to sweat, they would feel pain, and eventually we're told they would die. And we see that in Genesis chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. I'll just give you those references. You don't have to look at that, those verses. But as Jill said so clearly, we weren't made to die. And in a sense, I think that's why so many even believers uh, somehow try to, to, to come up with, fabricate this immortal soul. Because we weren't made to die and we're trying to get ourselves back to that immortality by ourselves. The Bible says God alone has immortality. And we are granted that, we put that on at the second coming of Jesus Christ. But we don't have it naturally. Sin cut that off and so you have that separation of the spirit and the body that together makes the soul and when that separation takes place and that spirit goes back to God, that breath goes back to God and that body goes down to the grave, we are done. Mm -hmm. In an unconscious sleep, yes. of course, the, that's the allegory, the, the, the uh, uh, symbolic sense in which, because, you know, when you sleep, of course, you're still alive, but when you're dead, you are dead, <laughs> yes. right? Yes. right? So we naturally, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes that God has put eternity in our hearts. We don't really want to die. And God really wants to restore us to the way he created us, you know, to live forever, to partake of that tree of life, to live forever. But... We have a process that we have to go through and that process requires us to trust in Him. And then there's a number four. The fourth consequence of sin, the quarterly goes on to say, is from an ecological perspective. Mm. That is, the natural world has degenerated. Yes. Genesis chapter 3, 17 and 18. So the Garden of Eden was no longer beautiful. It wasn't a pleasant place to be. You know, and I, I want to clarify this because, you know, the quarterly brings this out. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, maybe the garden kind of stayed because they were taken out of the garden and an angel was put there to guard the garden and, right. and I believe the garden might have been preserved but, but you've still got the rest of this planet and you start to see sin and you start to see death and you start to see dying. And Adam and Eve were beginning to see things that they'd never seen before. The kind of things that our fallen nature says, oh, the fall colors, aren't they beautiful? Look at all those trees and all those different colors. Isn't that beautiful? And Adam's like, no. And Eve's like, oh, no, what do we do? They're dying. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different perspective. We're kind of hardened to that, you know. But when they began to see this, they were overwhelmed with sadness. And so Adam and Eve did not immediately die. You know, the Bible says, in the day that you eat, you shall surely die. But I want to just bring this out a little bit, just kind of tease this, you know, because there is a sense in which they did die in that same night. There are different types of death yes, in the Bible, right? Yes. And there's a spiritual death. Yes. And so the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 and also 1 Timothy chapter 5 that those who live in sin are dead. They're spiritually dead. They're dead in trespasses and sins. The Bible says that Jesus Christ found us when we were dead in trespasses and sins. So is that spiritual death? They definitely died a spiritual yes, death. Amen. They definitely started pointing those fingers. And then we have this, this physical process of death. It's a process. I mean, when I was a baby, I know I was going in a certain direction. I don't know if it was when I got to 21 or 29 that I started going in another direction, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. There's a process. And, you know, science would say, well, actually, you start to die as soon as you're born, in a sense. There's a process of death that ends in the ultimate cessation of our lives. Mm -hmm. And that process began with Adam and Eve. And then there's this idea of this eternal life that was lost immediately. They no longer had access to the tree of life. Adam and Eve, all mankind, were to die within a day. Now, I just want to throw this out there. Second Peter talks about this. It says, you know, with the Lord and the Psalms do too, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day, right? That's an eternal life. When you're living for eternity, a thousand years goes by, it's like a day, right? <laughs> I just think it's interesting. I just think it's interesting that none of the human race lived to a thousand years. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Adam and everyone, they all died before a thousand years. 900 right. was That's the it. highest they went, That's right? In that day, eternal time now, we're talking about heavenly time, in that day you will surely die. So there's Ooh, many ways that we can read this, there's many ways that we can understand this. The Bible is really clear though that there's been some consequences, right? And this is the thing about God in relationship to love, in relationship to choice and freedom and risk and consequence. God doesn't remove the consequences, but God is gonna overrule the consequences. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in Romans chapter eight that 
all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them that are the called according to his purpose. So he's going to overrule those consequences in our lives as we put our trust in him. And our appeal to you, of course, in the context of our lesson this week and every week is we just encourage you, put your trust in the Lord. He's all about restoring us to the mm -hmm. image in which we were created. Hey, Amen. Amen. What a beautiful Amen. lesson each one of you have presented yes. thus far. It's so wonderful. I'm Shelley Quinn and my lesson is the first gospel promise. Love this. I just have to tell you, please read this lesson in your quarterly. I'm not presenting from the quarterly lesson. We figure you've got that and you can read it, but it's so beautifully written. So let's just look at Genesis 3.15. I have to mention this. Genesis 1 3, 11 covers 2,000 years of history. Mm. It's all compressed and distilled to those 11 chapters. We don't know how long Adam and Eve were in the garden before they succumbed mm. to sin, before they declared their independence from God. But one thing we do know is once they did that, and here's the serpent, here's the guilty pair. God is on the scene and listen to what mm -hmm. he says Amen. in Genesis 3.15. This is the initial messianic promise of the Bible. It's the message of hope for the future, the first prophetic announcement of the everlasting gospel of mm -hmm. God's divine grace. Genesis 3.15, mm -hmm. I, the Lord speaking, mm -hmm. will put enmity, this is a deep hatred, mm -hmm. between you, O serpent, and the woman, mm -hmm. and between your seed, your offspring, mm -hmm. and her seed in the singular, a uh, capital S. Mm -hmm. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Mm -hmm. In less than 30 words, God outlines mm. the spiritual outcome of the conflict between Satan and Christ, between good and evil. Enmity. God, when God says he's going to put enmity with those who are the seed of Satan, think about this. Satan hated the woman, the church. Mm -hmm. The seed of Satan hates the woman, mm -hmm. the church. They, they hate the followers of Christ mm -hmm. and they mock his righteous requirements. Mm -hmm. They ignore his authority. They're apathetic about his sacrifice mm -hmm. for them. But when it says her seed, do you realize this is a prophecy of the incarnation of Christ mm -hmm. being born to a virgin. It wasn't to the man's seed, but the woman's seed. He was mm -hmm. going to be born to a virgin. And you know what I love about this idea of enmity? Mm. When we are not with Christ, we don't hate sin. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we yeah. kind of laugh yeah. at it. Sometimes mm -hmm. you watch a, wow, a, yeah. a sitcom and it's mm -hmm. all about sinful mm -hmm. principles, but they've made it to look funny mm -hmm. and we laugh at it. Mm -hmm. But what happens when the Holy Spirit comes into our heart, when we are born again and he indwells us, mm -hmm. God, mm -hmm. it's that enmity is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. God begins to show us how he looks at things and we no longer find sin attractive or in any way entertaining. So this is actually, like I said in 30 words, we see the cross is prophesied in Genesis 3.15. Although Satan would bruise Christ's heel, causing him to suffer, what does it say? The seed, the singular seed is going to crush the head of mm -hmm. Satan. Right. Jesus utterly defeated Satan at the cross, Hebrews yeah. 2, 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he, Christ himself, likewise shared the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject 
to bondage. Colossians 2.15 says, at the cross, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. So now let's look at this. You know, a lot of people ask me, well, or say, oh, well, we're all children of God. No, we're not. Mm. Not unless you're born again. Yeah. Listen, 1 John 3, 8, he who sins is of the devil for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Mm -hmm. Jesus came to set the captives free and regain authority of this earth that Adam handed over to Satan. But Jesus is the last Adam wanted to bring this back. And the great controversy is soon coming to an end. Romans 16, 20 says, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Mm -hmm. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be mm -hmm. with you. So as Jill's already read, I'm going to read this again because I think this is such a critical scripture passage to understand. 1 Corinthians 15, 53 is talking about at the last trump when Jesus shows up to the first resurrection of the righteous to bring his children to heaven. It says this, and the reason I want to read it to you is because the final victory is won at the resurrection of the righteous. Mm. It says, this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal, talking about our mortal bodies that are laying in the graves until that time that he comes and calls on us. It, it, we mu this must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass this saying. This is Christ's final victory at the resurrection of the righteous. Mm -hmm. Death is swallowed up in victory. Yes. Oh, death, where is your sting? Mm -hmm. Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Mm -hmm. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. We know that death is going to be eventually when the devil is cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, Revelation 20, mm. 10, death will be no more. So here's my question. Were Adam and Eve aware of the fullness of this prophecy? Mm. How can we know? Mm. They, you know, like I said, 2000 years are condensed mm. into 11 chapters. One thing I do know, we're only seeing the highlight reel, right? Mm. But one thing I know is Genesis 3.20. Adam calls his wife Eve. And Eve, because she is the mother of all living, Adam's heart was overflowing with present hope. He thought he was going to be the first creature to die. And, and here, now God is giving them Genesis 3.15. So now he calls out a uh, Eve, his wife, Eve, he knows he's going to have children. He knows he's going to have grandchildren. He had present hope. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And when instead of Adam being the first physical death, it was an animal. Mm -hmm. God sacrificed an animal. Right. Their fig leaf covering mm -hmm. couldn't cover their sin. And you may wonder, well, why does it say they realized they were naked? Mm -hmm. Before they sinned, mm -hmm. they were covered with the Shekinah glory of God, the radiating light of the Lord. Mm -hmm. When they sinned, that was removed from them and they're going, oh, we're naked. Mm -hmm. So just think of this. In Genesis 3.21, it says, that the Lord God made hmm. tunics of skin and clothed Adam and Eve. What horror. You're talking mm. about them seeing the leaves die. Yeah. Yeah. What horror it must have been for them mm -hmm. to see a little lamb yeah. mm -hmm. who they had loved, mm -hmm. who they had nurtured, who they'd cared for, mm -hmm. to see that this 
substitute mm -hmm. had to die in their place mm -hmm. to cover their sin. And at this point, I fully believe they understood the deliverer was going to, I mean, God told them there would be a deliverer. Mm -hmm. It would come from her seed. But they understood that substitutionary death because God instituted the sacrificial system then. And you can say, well, how do you know that? Because they taught Cain and Abel mm -hmm. about God's sacrificial system. Mm -hmm. How do you know that? <laughs> God is not arbitrary. That's he right. did not arbitrarily choose and tell Cain bad right. and tell mm -hmm. Abel good sacrifice. So the Bible explains itself. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Beautiful study. I've enjoyed this one. Let's get some final thoughts here, Pastor Denzi. Well, you know, when we look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, uh, there are two things I want to point out. Satan will either come directly to try to deceive you or work through someone like he worked through Eve to deceive Adam. Now, here is Proverbs, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. I leave you with this thought, the last part. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. Mm -hmm. Amen. In Genesis 3, 4, you see the first lie that Satan told to Eve. And it's really the first false doctrine that we see coming forward there. And I'm so grateful that we can stand on the authority of the word of God and what God teaches about that. Amen. In Genesis chapter 3, 7 through 19, we see the consequences of sin. Those con consequences are being felt today in our own human nature and the way we relate to each other and we relate, the way we relate to God. But praise the Lord, we have a Savior, Jesus Christ, and He has come to remove all of those consequences mm -hmm. from us and from others. Amen. And I'd, I want to share two quick scriptures. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says that God made Him, Christ, mm -hmm. who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 9:28 says Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many and to those who eagerly wait for him to he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Amen. 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 This has been a powerful lesson. Thank you guys so much. I have a feeling that we're going to hear uh, a message in pr pertaining to the death of the lamb. Praise God for the death of the lamb. I have a feeling we're going to get into that, but a text that came to mind as we were going through this, of course, is John chapter 11, verse 25, where Jesus Christ makes it very clear. Beautiful text. He says, I am the resurrection mm -hmm. and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yes. he shall live. Mm -hmm. Praise God for the life of Jesus. My friends, thank you so much for joining us this week at, on the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We so appreciate your viewership, your support. You got to join us next week for lesson number three because it's entitled Understanding Human Nature. That's something we mm -hmm. can probably understand a little bit more about. God bless you all. We'll see you right back here next week.